the issue of trafficking in human beings is uh, a problem that in the current period can only be tackled in a coordinated manner when we are speaking about the European level. Um, just like the UN describes it, trafficking is a form of slavery and all the countries around the globe are touched by it in one form or another. Moreover, it uh, has several dimensions and facets that are all unfortunately manifested across the member states in Europe, such as trafficking for purposes such as sexual exploitation, labor exploitation, domestic servitude, begging, and removal of organs, which is sadly said, uh, it's, it's, um, we, we can find it among uh, children mostly. We are here today to discuss the existing situation in the European Union and try to find out the solutions and ways of addressing this matter in a coordinated manner, because we need a coordinated manner in, in this uh, issue. In a European Union without border controls and frontiers, where everybody is free to move everywhere uh, within the Europe, um, trafficking in human beings is also a cross-border issue that requires a fair amount of coordination from all authorities from all the countries. I believe that especially in this case we need a strategic approach in order to be able to fight this problem correctly and let's say efficiently. I would just like to give you some information on who are the victims that are most suffering from trafficking in Europe. And here uh, we come to the conclusions that uh, women, women are involved 77% of trafficking cases with sexual exploitation uh, with a factor of 87% out of this uh, seven, uh, 77. Forced labor is also a motive behind trafficking. According to the International Labour Organization, there are globally at least 2.45 million people in uh, forced labour as a result, uh, result of trafficking in person, which is a very high uh, amount. Most people are trafficked into forced labour for commercial sexual exploitation, that is about 43%, or various other reasons, 25%. The reminder, uh, 32% are victims of uh, trafficking for economic exploitation. Uh, anyway, women, women and girls represent 56% of victims and uh, men and boys 44%. As regards forced commercial sexual exploitation, an overwhelming majority of 98% uh, is uh, representing by women and girls. This is enough to, to show us that women and children have the highest risk. Especially in the case of children, reports and studies on concrete situations, like the report of anti-trafficking monitoring group done, by, uh, done in, in the UK, show that there are many situations where the victims do not come forward because they are fearful that their immigration status will be uh, brought to the attention of the national authorities and that's why they, they are feared to, to come and um, reclaim uh, the, the trafficking. In the same manner, the European Agency for Fundamental Rights report on child trafficking in the EU talks about children that disappear from immigration uh, shelters and are not accounted for by national authorities. There are no statistics being done at this level and children that are suspected of, uh, of being the victims of human trafficking can still be detained on immigration offenses according to the national legislation in, in the member states of the EU. More needs to be done in these respects and apart from the EU provisions that can be established, the national authorities must also come forward and they have to, they have to have the will and interest to collaborate with each other. I'm certain that uh, through this seminar, we will be able at least to shed some light on the nature of this issue, and that we will also try to identify maybe some policy aspects that can be implemented not only at the European level, but possibly and necessary, I, I would say, at the national level in order to 
uh, to solve the problems. So I would uh, I would like to uh, then to welcome you again to this seminar and to hope that we will really find some uh, some some solutions maybe. And uh, thank again to to the speakers and to my colleagues. And I would also like to to say you that. Uh, I, I will apologize, but at a certain moment, I would need to, to leave the room for another uh, meeting. So thank you very much. And OK, thank you very much. Uh, dear guests, dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, also I would like to thank all of you <coughs> for your presence at this uh, seminar. Uh, indeed, the problem of uh, the human trafficking is an increasingly disturbing phenomenon in Europe. After the fall of communism, closed society opened, plant economies collapsed, and people looked towards the West for opportunity. Unfortunately, many people seeking to immigrate to the West, as well as many others in more disparate situations, and without such high aspirations, became victims of human trafficking, which is as my colleague uh, Ramon already mentioned, a grave, grave violation of human rights and international law. It is an illegal clandestine activity aimed at removal of organs for economic purposes, as well as sexual exploitation, street crime, domestic servitude, or other forms of labor exploitation, described also as modern day slavery. It is a scourge that impedes access to healthcare and hampers the development of people and entire nations. In Europe alone, more than 500,000 people be become victims of human trafficking annually. They become isolated from the world and yet all too ready to latch onto the first person who seems to care for him or her. This and any sort of emotional trauma or abuse greatly increases vulnerability to human trafficking which alarmingly includes large numbers of children and women, definitely. According to the International Labour Organization, as Ramona already mentioned, 98% of the victims of sexual exploitation are girls and women who lead to the recognition of so-called gender-specific phenomenon of trafficking that is mentioned in the EU policy. However, all to the fact that Preventing and combating trafficking in human beings is a priority for the EU and the member states. There should be the facilitation of an anti-trafficking coordinator, which may include, for example, the improvement of coordination and coherence, avoiding duplication of efforts between EU institutions and EU agencies as well as with member states and international actors. Recently, several reports have highlighted the urgent need to raise public awareness of trafficking and to educate the community towards the end of arming the people with information and how they can protect themselves. In order to encourage greater political will by the member states and facilitate policy discussion on tackling human trafficking, me and my colleagues uh, Mrs. Manescu and Mr. Takula, we are proud to host uh, this event uh, aimed at raising awareness of this hidden crime and welcomes also the participation of our uh, valuable and distinguished speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ramona and Metin, uh, for your introductions and uh, I just <coughs> would like to add or underline that, that when we talk about the human trafficking, um, it is the real problem nowadays in Europe and not only in Europe, in all over the world. And uh, human trafficking is uh, these days slavery. And uh, in the European Union, we say that we have some basic values. Our values are democracy, human rights, freedom of express. And we say that that's our core values. But when we're looking for the situation, what happened around us, we have to say that we, we, have, we, have, we have to do a lot when we, that we can reach that kind of situation that we can say that we really have the human rights, that all people who live in Europe have the human rights. And, and I think that we have to 
make some real actions that we can tackle the problem uh, which name is human trafficking in the European level. I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, who is going to give a global perspective, Mr. Windley Phipps. I have to say that I met Windley Phipps uh, several years ago when I was in uh, Washington, D.C. I took part of the event organized by President of the United States, uh, Mr. George W. Bush, and uh, that was the first time when I met Mr. Phipps, and Mr. Phipps is a founder and CEO of U.S. Dream Academy, and he is, as you may know, the well-known singer, and, uh, and uh, he is very, very well-known in, in that field, but also for field in mentoring and, and give the lectures in all around the world. So, as uh, someone of you who took part of this morning, this national, uh, this our, our, our European prayer breakfast already heard that that um, Mr. Windley Phipps, uh, he is two-time Grammy, nom uh, Grammy Award nominee and has sung for all U.S. presidents since Ronald Reagan. Also, two years ago, he performed at, he performed at President Obama's inauguration. He has also sung to Pope John Paul II, for President, uh, to President Nelson Mandela, to Mother Teresa, and he has been working with Billy Graham, Oprah Winfrey, Diana Ross, Chris Tucker, and many, many others. So he has a very long list what he has done, and, uh, and he's very active in, in this field when we talk about uh, human rights and when we try to uh, tackle the problems what we have in our society. And he is a man who really work for the equal rights and the human rights, and, uh, and that's what I, what I really appreciated. And I'm, I'm very ha happy that Mr. Phipps, you accepted my invitations together with by, uh, together with your wife Linda, and that we have uh, able to have you here in this in in, in this uh, day. So, Mr. Phipps, floor is yours. And uh, there are some young people; they already asked that. Do you think because they they saw your your video in in YouTube? Might be some of you know that it's the most. Um, famous YouTube video in the, in the gospel music. More than 8 million people have already seen that uh, Amazing Race video. It's uh, taped in, uh, in um, New York City, York City Carnegie, Hall. Carnegie Hall, some years ago. But anyway, so you can do that in acoustically or whatever. You, you know what is the best way to do that, but uh, floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. First, I would like to uh, begin my remarks uh, by extending my thanks to Minister Takula for the courage he has displayed in bringing to the forefront perhaps the most important human rights issue of our time, human trafficking. It is very heartening to know that this issue is being placed squarely upon the agenda of the European Parliament with the hopes that just as chattel slavery was roundly condemned and squarely abandoned as a strategy for commerce in the British Empire that led by a new generation of parliamentary leaders like William Wilberforce was in his time, that this, the European Parliament, would lead the nations of the globe in efforts to set human trafficking uh, as one of those relics of the past where we abandoned it as a strategy for commerce in our time and in our world. I won't speak very long because I learned a long time ago that for a message to be immortal, it does not have to be eternal. Uh, I come before you today, however, <clears throat> as one carrying in my veins the blood of those who have been victims of one of the most terrific examples of human trafficking in all of history, the transatlantic 
slave trade, otherwise known as the African diaspora. My forefathers were uprooted from their homes, sold as chattel, and made to labor for the enrichment of others. My great-great-grandmother was once sold and bartered as a commodity, as an article of trade, an item for cons consumption, an item for consumption. My great-great-grandfather was used for forced labor. Preparing for this conference, I must tell you, forced me to examine the role that human trafficking played in my heritage. Uh, I live in the United States, but I was born in Trinidad in the West Indies where slavery and its vestiges are never far from your mind or your consideration. I've come to realize that this history gives me an interesting perspective on this issue that we address today and I hope that my comments will be helpful. Frankly, human trafficking and slavery is not something that people who are blessed to live in the Western world take the time to think about. The slavery that is a part of my heritage is a poignant and sobering history. It never escapes me that were it not for fate, my great-great-grandfather's story could have been mine and my story could have been his. The question of how long this evil has been with us is a complicated one. Slavery and her twin sister, human trafficking, have had a long and sordid history together. Throughout the history of humankind, in every nation, in every race, and upon every continent, slavery and human trafficking have in different eras and different times, both reared their ugly heads. Every world empire, from the Babylonians to the Greeks to the Romans, has tried to extend its might and domination while holding in bondage unique classes of slaves. All of the great economic empires of history have used slaves to lay the cornerstone of their greatness. And ironically, in their treatment of slaves, many of them sowed the seeds of rebellion, of judgment, of hatred, and retribution. One writer tells how, because of slavery, the Romans became addicted to ease and selfishness and self-indulgence, which in the end played a part in the downfall of their empire. For you see, no empire can long exist that tolerates inequality and injustice. For anyone who may not be clear, human trafficking is the illegal trade in human beings for the purposes of commercial or sexual exploitation or forced labor. And the consequences of human trafficking today are myriad, complex, and manifold from the spread of sexually transmitted diseases to the crushed dreams of a child, to the incalculable loss of human potential, the incalculable loss of human potential. In ways we don't often consider, human trafficking is a destructive force that shames a nation and stains its legacy. American history is tarnished forever by this practice of chattel slavery. And America as a nation, even today, continues to be tormented by the vexing vestiges and remnants of its past. In 1807, the British Parliament banned the slave trade. And in 1833, slavery was abolished from British colonies. By then, human trafficking and the slave trade had made many people rich and had built the economies of many colonies and nation. The, the Holocaust is a more recent example of human trafficking used for a most nefarious of purposes, human genocide. But since the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, too many have turned a blind eye to this evil practice 
And today we have more millions in our world living in relative slavery than ever before. We see it in forced prostitution, child labor, debt bondage, wage slavery, even contract slavery where poor and illiterate people are tricked into signing contracts that must be satisfied through long hours and hard, unreasonable label, labor. Yes, today, human trafficking wears many faces. In spite of the fact that human trafficking is a criminal offense and that nations and states are required to take effective measures to prohibit vessels carrying their flags from taking part, in spite of the fact that nations and states are supposed to ensure that their ports and airfields, their coast and border crossings are not used for the conveyance of slaves. In spite of existing efforts today, still human trafficking is on the rise in our world. Almost every country on the face of the earth is affected either as a source nation, a transit nation, or a destination nation. Article 4 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says no one shall be held in slavery or servitude in our world. And slavery and the slaves shall be prohibited in all their forms. And in spite of all our declarations, many are still lured into slavery with the promise of good jobs and salaries and then often sold into prostitution. <laughs> It is estimated that the average time of enslavement of those who have been trafficked is between two and five years. Some victims have been held for as many as 20 years. They labor in agricultural fields, in domestic service. Some are passed off as mail order brides. Many of the poorest countries in the world have the highest incidence of trafficking. Poverty is a common causal thread that runs through the story of modern human trafficking. Sadly, women and girls are more vulnerable to being tricked and coerced into sexual servitude. Some are even sold into trafficking by their own parents. I read of an Asian girl who was sold by her father to get the money he needed for an engine for his boat. Once in their possession, traffickers use brutality and violence to hold their victims in fear, silence, and servitude. There are even instances of trafficking that occurs in plain sight. My executive assistant, uh, whose father is an African American, whose mother is uh, from uh, France, uh, as a little girl, she, tol she told me that once they were changing planes in the Heathrow Airport, and a man walked up to them and said to her mother, how much for her? In plain sight in the Heathrow airport, how much for her? And she had to grab her child and hold her close. As William Wilberforce demonstrated in England more than a century ago, legislation and international conventions are a crucial step in striking a death blow to slavery in all its forms. But history has also taught us that legislation, laws, and international conventions are not enough. Without enforcement, they are toothless tigers. I also believe that blows must be struck at the very source of this vile river that pollutes the civilized minds of men. I once read a story of two little boys who were fishing by a creek and they saw a body floating downstream. And they jumped in and pulled the body out, gave him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, realized that he needed more help. So they threw him on their shoulders and carried him a half an hour to a hospital and saved him. According to the story, a couple of weeks later, two weeks later, they were fishing by the same spot and saw another body floating downstream and jumped in and pulled him out, put him on their shoulders, carried him a half hour to the hospital, and saved him. <clears throat> According to the story, it started happening with alarming regularity. So the city fathers said, why don't we build a hospital right by the spot 
so we don't have to keep transporting the bodies. And they built this hospital, it grew, the administration grew, the bureaucracy grew, until one day an intern doctor who had completed his residency at the hospital asked to see the hospital administrator. And he said, I have learned so much since I have been here, but can you tell me something? Has anybody gone upstream to find out why the bodies keep falling in the river in the first place? I believe that we must build safe houses downstream, like mighty Nepal, to rescue those who find themselves trapped into slavery by cunning, conniving, deceiving men and women. But I believe firmly we must also go upstream to find out why the bodies keep falling into the river in the first place. For me, it is not an either or, it is a both and. Frankly, I don't believe we can build enough safe houses in the world to adapt to the evil imaginations of men. Uh, one lady that I met that has been an inspiration, Lady Caroline Cox, who served in the House of Lords, she spent over 100,000 pounds freeing more than 2,000 slaves at an average cost of 45 pounds apiece. I've met Lady Caroline Cox and I applaud her work, but I must tell you, I do not believe that we can raise enough money to rescue. I heard someone once say, a man cannot ride your back unless it is bent. And I believe we must combat this problem also at the level of cultural and even religious beliefs that allow this form of modern slavery to be countenanced in our world. So many of the causes of human trafficking are being taken up by this parliament already. And I applaud that, causes that are intended to result in a better quality of life. In a time of great economic uncertainty, initiatives put forward by this parliament that improve the health and wealth of their societies are also a blow against human trafficking. Improved access to education, which builds character and skills and gives the individual boy or girl a sense of meaning and self-worth, all these efforts are important. Unless women and children are blessed with these gifts of opportunity, they are often defenseless against those who through fraud and trickery prey upon the vulnerable and the innocent. But to curb and stop this, the vilest of all crimes, we must attack it at its source. I believe human trafficking exists in part because of the lack of integrity and authentic faith in the world. The inability of men to have integrity and integrate their high rhetoric with their low conduct allows slavery to flourish. A nation that proclaims, or a union that proclaims all men are free and equal and claims to affirm the dignity of man and, it, and yet is not aggressive in its fight against human trafficking is a union or a nation without integrity. Integrity is when lofty profession and principles are integrated with laws and conduct. A nation without integrity, a union without integrity, is a danger to humanity. As I went upstream searching for the causes of slavery and human trafficking, I found two primary causal factors that I want to leave with you today. The first is greed. According to the International Labor Organization and the United Nations, human trafficking in all of its many forms nets more than $32 billion each year for traffickers. They are larger than Walmart. <laughs> Slavery exists because the greed of many choose, who choose to believe that human lives can be bought, sold, used up, and then discarded. Now greed may be a sin, but it is not yet a crime. 
The only way to combat greed is on a spiritual level by shaming and promoting and celebrating and glorifying its counterpart, which is really generosity and love. It may be unrealistic to think we will ever successfully combat greed in our world, but we must continue to try. The second primary causal factor is the failure to make universal a sense of reverence for the dignity of man. The loss of this sense of sacredness for the dignity of man is a profound loss. It is a grievous loss. It is for any nation, society, and civilization a harbinger of social collapse and a forerunner of calamity. We must, and this union must always declare through law and legislation, unequivocally, that human dignity is not for sale. My appeal to the conscience of the nations that make up this union is simply to make clear that human dignity is not for sale. The road is not going to be easy. I heard an old man say one day, if the mountain was smooth, you couldn't climb it. We don't climb smooth mountains. Nothing good ever really comes easy. And I leave you with the words of Robert Kennedy, who said, each time a man or person stands for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice. He sends a tiny ripple of hope and causing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring. Those ripples, he said, build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. I want to thank the European Union. I want to thank Minister Takula and all of those who are here today for doing all in your power to say to the rest of the world that human dignity is not for sale, that human trafficking will always uh, scourge us, but we must celebrate and res promote respect for the humanity and dignity of each individual. Thank you for doing all that you can. Uh, I will say this, uh, why we must attack the sources I leave you, that I read once of in New York City a crack, a disturbing crack appeared on the 42nd floor of a high-rise apartment building and they sent for the architect to investigate. When he arrived uh, the building manager heard that he was in the building and took the elevator to the 42nd floor and looked around and couldn't find him. And he was told, oh no, he, he's not up on the 42nd floor. Uh, he's in the sixth basement, six floors under the ground. And so the building manager took the elevator to the sixth basement. And when he found him, he said, uh, what are you doing here? He said, I'll crack is on the 42nd floor. The architect said, your crack may be on the 42nd floor, but your problem is not on the 42nd floor. Your problem is at the foundation. A true story, apparently what had happened was a security guard who worked in the building wanted to build a garage onto his house. And so every day before leaving work, he would take the elevator to the sixth basement and chisel out a brick, put it in his bag, and take it home. And after five years of doing that, a crack appeared on the 42nd floor. We must go to the foundation of reaffirming and rebuilding and promoting and celebrating human dignity. We can't fix this problem by just trying to fix the crack on the 42nd floor. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, <coughs> Mr. Phipps, for your strong and emotional appeal for more human dignity. I remember your strong message that human dignity is not for sale. And indeed, nation or union without integrity is a danger. It's not a necessary uh, one uh, that we, will, we could live without attention. And uh, the most important is that the human trafficking uh, is covered by silence, by fear, by, by violence. And the legislation, as you mentioned very, very rightly, is not enough without enforcement. So thank you very much once again. And from the United States, uh, I propose to, to, call, to go to the, west, to the Western Balkans, to the Balkans, to the Eastern Europe. And uh, I would like to turn to Mrs. Uh, Zornitsa Ilieva, who is an uh, expert uh, working for the Bulgarian NGO, the Center Nadia. Mrs. Ilieva was born in Kustendil, Bulgaria. She earned a Master of, of Economics of the University of National and World Economy in Sofia. From 1998 till 2009, Mrs. Ilieva worked as a chief expert at the National Assembly of Bulgaria. Uh, she was very active in the work of women parliamentarians on issues of gender equality, human trafficking, the rights of women and children, violence among women and children and others. And particularly, she was active with uh, the Bulgarian NGOs uh, like NIDA Center, Animus, and others. In 2010, Mrs. Ilieva participated in the elaboration of a project under the Agenda Europe of Sofia Municipality on the topic implementation of European practices and standards for resolving problems of violence among women and children in the territory of the Bulgarian capital. So uh, Mrs. Ilieva uh, will share with us the experiences regarding the issue of human trafficking in the Balkans, which emerged as a nexus point in the trafficking of persons into the EU, especially women. Thank you very much once again for coming, Mrs. Ileva, and give the floor. Thank you, Mr. Kazak. First of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation to participate in this seminar. And uh, special thanks to Mr. Kazak who showed uh, his interest uh, to my activity related to the trafficking in, the, in women on the Balkans. For the limited time that we have, I will try to point out of the main aspects of this problem on the Balkans. The countries in Eastern Europe, the Balkans in particular, face great challenge Part of them are members of the EU, the others are on their way to the EU with different speed on integration. With regards to this, they have to solve the problems connected to illegal human trafficking in all of its shapes, regardless of whether it is motivated by prostitution and criminality of just by desire to use the economic possibility to immigrate to rich countries. The Balkans are becoming a transit way for illegal movement of people looking for better life in the West. For Bulgaria in, par in particular, this matter is directly connected to the forthcoming joining to the Schengen, uh, Schengen Agreement. According to the European Commission, about 80% of the victims of trafficking are women and about 50% of them are minors and need protection. The main reason for developing this kind of criminal activity are the poverty, unemployment, and also corruption, which hinder the implementation of the law. Trafficking is uh, not smuggling, it is modern slavery, and finding solution to this problem requires the united efforts of the Balkan countries and the non-governmental organization there to defend the victims and punish the traffickers. The existing of channels and networks for human trafficking, women in particular, who 
which enhance the whole region, requires effective united policy and coordination, good information and exchange of evidence, adequate financing, functioning NGOs, reacting citizenship and professional media in order to achieve positive results in the fight against trafficking. The report of the Ministry of Internal Affairs of Bulgaria showing this year in the country have been taken 261 procedures for victims of trafficking, of which 157 have been solved, and there were 77 convicted persons. The women victims of trafficking have been 523, from which 79 were minors. The results, these results follow the united efforts of the relative services in Bulgaria, France, Greece, Poland, etc. The real support of the victims of trafficking, their social adaptation and psychological help is left to the NGO sector. The sexual exploitation of this basic human trafficking in the Balkans. After the end of the communist era in this region, the countries that underwent very complex political, economical, and social changes which led to unemployment and drastic fall in the standard of living. For a great number of women, prostitution becomes the only possible way to earn their life and uh, feminization of poverty is, is the basic of the problem. In many cases, the reason to leave their country are not only economical, but also social and security, potential or real civil and transborder conflicts. Bulgaria is nowadays transit country for women trafficking for sexual exploitation, and the final destination are Greece, Italy, Germany, and Spain. The women trafficking are stimulated by the present military contingents on the Balkans, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Macedonia and Kosovo. Regardless of the serious measures that have been taken, the consumers of such sexual services do not consider themselves against the law because women deliver these services voluntarily. In fact, According to the United Nations report, the role of women in society is constantly increases, increasing and their labor gives up to 75% of the world production. At the same time, they receive only 10% of annual incomes. Bulgaria is not the only country in the region for transit of human trafficking. Macedonia is a transit country, not a final destination for women and children coming from Moldova, Ukraine, and other East European countries. At the same time, trafficking of Macedonian women in the former Yugoslavia region continues. <coughs> Albania is also a main source of illegal trafficking of women, children for sexual exploitation, and forced labor in Italy and Greece. From there, very often, they go to the other countries of the EU. Albanian children, especially gypsies, are illegally taken out of the country, forcing them to start begin in the countries of the EU. This is also a problem for Romania and to a certain extent for Bulgaria too. Bosnia and Herzegovina is a country which is a source, transit way, a destination for victims of illegal traffic, mainly gypsies. Kosovo is also a source transit away and destination, and that internal human trafficking becomes a serious problem there. Serbia and uh, Montenegro have the same problems to solve. Traveling without visas for most of the Balkan countries imposes the need for better border control, new identity documents according the EU requirements, the implementation of effective system for electronic communication between border crossing points. There is a relatively new phenomenon in human trafficking which relates to the sale of unborn or newly born babies. 
many of Gypsy's origin to countries with the better financial possibilities. Although the number is not shocking, but the fact that this kind of trafficking exists shows that there are problems in society. Such cases exist in all Balkan countries. The main reasons are economic. Here we can mention also the illegal sale of human organs for transplantation. The lack of uh, adequate application for the law in the region created the possibility for the origin organized crime to expand the network for human trafficking and to increase their profits from this criminal business. According to some reports, the annual profit of human trafficking is between 8 and 10 billion in euros. Of euros, sorry. In fact, the economic reason for which women in most cases fall in the networks of their traffickers lately have been transformed and the accent is not on poverty and misery, but on quick and easy money. In this way, young women might not leave their home trying to earn money for better education, more independent life, easy achieved financial independence, and so fall into the networks of the traffickers. In comparison with women forces with violence to the join the networks, their number is not big, but the fact is in self speak, speaks for wrong education, existing and violence within the family, and mental degradation. At the same time, time, the existing disbelief in the possibility of the institution to help makes the work of the traffickers easier. For the Balkan countries, this is a problem which is not rele relevant of the old member states of the EU. According to research, only 30% of the women that have been victims of trafficking believe that they can receive adequate help from the policy if they make a complaint. Here comes the problem with corruption. In relation to this, it is important to inform you that a week ago in Bulgaria was presented national mechanism for referral and support of trafficking persons. This is a frame for cooperation and coordination between state services and the citizen society concerning the human trafficking victims. The main purpose to the ensure the respectation of the human rights of the victims of trafficking to render effective services and guide the victims to the adequate services services. This national mechanism will help the national policy for protection of the victims and the connected policies concerning the regulation of stay and repatriation, repatriation giving compensation to the victims, protecting of witnesses, etc. The mechanism reflects the existing European policies and practices concerning the protection of the victims of trafficking, which are implemented in the Convention of Action Against Trafficking is Human Being of the Council of Europe and the proposal from the European Commission Directive on Preventing and Combating Trafficking in Human Being and Protecting Victims. Policies connected to helping the victims of trafficking, their willingness to cooperate for re re revealing the crime, their security and the security of their personal information, defending the interests of the victims. With this mechanism, standard operating procedures of identification, security, and long-term integration of the victims are accepted. Also, the aim is to coordinate the efforts of the state institution, local authorities, NGO, media, and the citizen society to get involved in the struggle against human trafficking and transfer it to a regional level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Ilieva. Definitely the problem of human trafficking, of, and especially women and children, the trafficking of organs is one of the major problems in the Balkan region, in Bulgaria and former Yugoslavia. And I think uh, what we need is also uh, 
a strong uh, cooperation between state authorities, uh, between poli the, the police uh, authorities, between, between NGOs, and also the involvement of the civil society. Thank you very much for uh, this presentation. And uh, now uh, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Torsten Moritz, who is a, a German uh, expert. Uh, he studied political science in Bonn in Berlin. He has a PhD in political sciences at the Free University of Berlin and has broad research experience in Eastern and Central European transformation after 1989. Um, since uh, 2002, Ms., uh, Dr. Moritz uh, is working for the Church's Commission for Migrants in Europe as project secretary, acting uh, and ad advocating uh, with the European Parliament and the European Commission, as well as the Council of Europe and in the Interregional Global Ecumenical Network on migration of the World Church, Church uh, Council of Churches. He is an active in conceptualizing and implementing a variety of projects and research initiatives among other issues on migration and development, trafficking in human beings, refugee resettlement and integration of the third country nationals. So uh, Dr. Morris will give us the current observations and policy recommendations on trafficking in human beings in Europe. Dr. Moritz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I will not say a great deal about what our organization stands for. You can come back to that in a minute, but I'll use my 20 minutes for talking about the issue at stake. And, and first of all, just a little notion of what we're talking about we often talk about human trafficking. I find that a dangerous terminology. Even if it takes more time, we should talk about trafficking in human beings. There is nothing human about trafficking. It is deeply e inhuman, and I think we are banalizing the problem if we talk about human trafficking. Uh, and often our concepts are very much shaped by the way we express things, so I think we should be careful here. Uh, I can give you a couple of snapshots on development in Europe, and, and a lot of it echoes what our colleagues have already been saying. Um, I will focus on three areas of trafficking, trafficking for sexual exploitation, trafficking for forced labor, as well as a special un undergroup trafficking in children. We have heard about issue of trafficking for the removal of organs. We have to say that there we are beginning to explore the stories behind the headlines. So far, it's very difficult to come to very clear pictures there. In the other areas, we have a bit more of an idea, even though what I'm going to tell you is still fragmented. Every statistic which has been mentioned here is completely accurate, and yet it just represents the interest and the investigation methods of those who have been, been putting the statistic together. We still don't know a great deal about trafficking in details, uh, which has to do a bit with, with, with the energy which is publicly um, given and the amount of resources which is given to investigating where trafficking takes place. In the area of sexual exploitation, uh, as well as in, in the other areas, the two movements we have is a, is a east-west movement, but also a south-north movement. I would like to keep that in mind. The first issues of trafficking we had in Europe were in the 1970s. We often tell it it had happened, happened after 1989. No, trafficking has been there very, very early. In that time, it was women from southeast Euro uh, Asia or, or Latin America being trafficked into Europe, and that still is a reality as well as, as trafficking from Africa. But of course, we have a lot of inner European trafficking, east-west trafficking mainly. Um, we have what is, you've already been describing, by five to ten years ago, we would often have cases of trafficking where, where those who, who became victims were, were well, were irritated and were, were given false information about what would be awaiting them exactly, what kind of job. We now more and more see that the recruitment really happens with, you're going to work as a dancer in a, in a striptease bar. You're going to work in prostitution, but with very unclear information about what that really entails, what the working conditions are. But that, of course, the fact that, that often the victims we find nowadays are being told what kind of work would be expected of them makes it much more difficult for them to say afterwards, it's, I've been duped, I've been really betrayed here. What we also see is a slippery slope development. First, it seems okay, this is a job which is not, not a declared job, but which is still acceptable, and then payments are withheld, then there's psychological pressure and so forth. So what we are seeing are more and more subtle forms of exploitation. 
We have over the last 10, 15 years seen development of support infrastructure for victims of, of, of trafficking for sexual exploitation, predominantly women. However, these are very frail. The UK um, House of Commons, for example, in 2006 investigated the support structure and said, well, we have far too little places for accommodating victims of trafficking. 2009, they revisited it and said, the situation still hasn't changed. We still are not prepared to uh, adequately support those who are most vulnerable in the situation. We have a support infrastructure which in the immediate follow-up of, of, of somebody escaping from trafficking helps, but which has very little long-term support. Czech Republic, for example, the colleagues have a program which runs for three months, but after that, normally the victim is supposed to have been rehabilitated, re-established. Everyone who knows a bit about trauma, about, about the vulnerability, knows very clearly three months is not enough, but we have very little in long-term support. <coughs> In the area of trafficking for forced labor, we have big, big problems in the areas of agriculture, in the areas of construction, in domestic services. Here, one of the very, very clear obstacles to, to overcoming trafficking in that area is there's very little institutional support to investigate. Very often, while you're in the area of trafficking for sexual exploitation, usually in a country have one or two assistance centers. There's very little out there for people who've been trafficked into forced labor. There's very often a little outreach program. There's very, very little support. And very often, if there is a state intervention, it is more state intervention looking at undeclared labor, trying to penalize those who are pre performing undeclared labor, rather than looking at, is there a condition where you should be supported as somebody who's become a victim? There is a limited interest to investigate. I'm not mentioning the country, but a, but a colleague from the Ministry of Interior once told me, we know forced labor exists in our country. We know it is big. We know that it happens in the context of trafficking. But we think we open a Pandora's box once we look at it. It's far too big for us to handle. So at the moment, there's a big, big institutional reluctance to look at it. And something which is also very, very difficult is, if you look at the situations of trafficking for forced labor, the exploitation there, if you look at the workplace situation, it, it may look pretty normal. You say a couple of workers, we say it's slavery, but the problem is it no longer looks like slavery. So it's very, very difficult to conceptualize that there is a real problem, that there is exploitation, that there is, 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 is reprisals behind the situation where you might say, okay, there are people working maybe without a proper contact, but all in all, it doesn't look too bad. Trafficking in children. Of course, the whole area is very, very closely related to the instances of forced begging, forced p petty crime. There, once again, we have the problem. Very often, public authorities are looking at it mainly as a law and order problem. And of course, it is a law and order problem. You don't want people in, in your shopping streets to be, be pickpocketed. But often, the investigation goes very little further than that. It doesn't look at the exploitative mechanisms behind it. And very little looks at the best interests of the child behind it, what would need to be done to help these children to get out of the situation which they haven't chosen themselves. These are some of the, the, the tendencies we have which are, at the moment, worrying. Um, as I said, if you look at it in a, in a, in a 10, 15 years perspective, you might say, yes, we ha the fact that trafficking is becoming more subtle in its forms of exploitation is an indication of success because persecution has been successful. They're no longer as blatantly, obviously, doing it as they used to be, but the problem is still there. And we've heard from our two speakers before, as long as some of the root causes are there, as long as poverty is there, systematic disenfranchisement of certain groups in society, be it minority groups, be it women and children. And on the other hand, a willingness to accept services, to accept work performed under conditions which you would no longer accept for yourself or your family or your own nationals, trafficking is going to flourish. What we need on the area of policy, and I mean, this House here has Monday, as a, in a joint vote of the, the, the FAM and LIBE committee, adopted a directive which in many ways is going into the right direction, I think. We need legislation which strengthens the rights of the most vulnerable. We need to be very, very clear those who have been trafficked, who have been victimized by something, should not be re-victimized by our policy. And unfortunately, that still often is the case, that they're forced interviews, that, that persons who've been, been, been trafficked are forced to give evidence without being properly counseled about what kind of consequences this will have for them. We need some form of protection of those who might be most vulnerable to be exploited. And that, for us, has a lot to do with rediscussing migration policies and discussing the rights of those who may be undocumented or, in other ways, most vulnerable towards exploitation. We need to discuss the whole issue of 
can we identify trafficking by looking at ex exploitation mainly and not at, at migration status? Very often we clearly need to say, let's look at the risk which might be involved when somebody returns home. Is there any kind of alternative? Would these people need to get, have some kind of access to protection in our countries where they find themselves at the moment? Question, of course, also is how much can we translate the declarations which we have in speeches against trafficking in human beings and on a Sunday into day-to-day -day politics during the week? Is it something where we're willing to invest money into investigation? Is there something which we're willing to invest money for, for support? Even in a country like Belgium, where there's a very good infrastructure of support, a lot of the funding for the infrastructure for support still comes from the national lottery. I think very few people who are investigating drug crimes would, would uh, rely on the national lottery for, for doing central parts of their work. So if we're really serious about saying protection is something which is part of combating trafficking in human beings, then we need to make that a commitment which comes with a budget envelope. And that is something you know that I'm coming from a non-governmental perspective, which also goes for the state sector. A lot of the police colleagues investigating these issues are extremely frustrated who are telling me, well, if I investigate a bike theft or a case of trafficking, in our statistics nowadays, it's one case solved. And of course, if I find somebody with a bike which is not his, his that's a very clear case. If I find somebody who's in a situation of exploitation, a whole investigation starts. So if we're serious about investigating trafficking, this needs also to translate into something uh, which comes with a budget envelope and with a political commitment. Last point, and I would like to leave you with that, is we're very much talking about trafficking as something which is the most horrible crime, and it is. That is very, very clear. But it's not so much out of the ordinary. It has a lot to do with the way our society is structured, the way we consume, what we're willing to accept as conditions of work, as conditions of residence for people who are not nationals of our countries, and the way we are going to pay for it. A colleague from the European Trade Union Congress always asked when we talk about trafficking for, for in agriculture, what's the price of a tomato? How much are you willing to <laughs> pay for a, a, a kilo of tomatoes? And unless we're, and it comes back to what you've been saying here, greed is at it, but we're in so many areas of our, our society today willing to accept greed as the underlying principle that we really need to dig quite deep. So I'm with you in saying we need to go down to the sixth bottom floor and try to find out are the fundamentals on which our societies are built. We always want to believe their solidarity, their expression, freedom of law, freedom, rule of law, really still valid if they are not valid for a certain group who's living among us. I'll leave you with that. Thanks. <laughs>
in the southern Mediterranean. If you look at the figures, if you look at the competitiveness, you could say either, either these people have robots or little, little miracles happening or they need to exploit. So it comes back to that. If you look at the conditions of, of care for the elderly in many, many countries across the EU, how much the demand is and how much our society, that may be insurances, that may be individuals, are willing to pay for it. You can say this can only happen through undeclared work, which may be okay, or undeclared work, which is b badly underpaid, which is exploitative, and which is working against that. And you find that in many areas, you find construct in many countries, construction sector is organized in a way that it could not work with ordinary working conditions. Um, the cleaning sector in a country like Greece, it's very, very clear that the contracts which are given out there. So it comes back to the question, can we really say, okay, the cheapest bid is always the best, or do we need to factor something in, which I would call protection of the European social model? If we're serious about the European social model, it needs to apply for all those who find themselves in here, and not those who have had the, the advantage of being, being uh, born here, and therefore are a bit more privileged. I hope that answers it, at least part. I would say that uh, it, it is really shocking and painful how even the most uh, well-meaning of us can turn a blind eye or look away when we get uh, a cheaper price. <laughs> if we are all honest with ourselves, uh, we we are almost prepared, even the best of us, to uh, get a bargain at the price of someone's dignity, whether they are cleaning, whether they are building, whether they are <clears throat> working for us in any way. And so you, we have to go back again to the heart of man, because even the best of us look away and accept the discount uh, that is purchased at the expense of the dignity of humanity. Uh, I will try to um, answer at least partially to your question in my, uh, in my uh, little uh, talk later on, but I believe that the core issue some is somewhat deeper and uh, that it has to do with the human condition in general. But I will not go into it. Uh, I'll just briefly refer to it now. So, and the next questions here. Welcome. I remember hearing that uh, it's a hidden problem. Maybe the solution is hidden somewhere as well. So uh, as we have two experts here sp from the US and f uh, from the EU, I would like to have a little comparison how we are tackling the problems in the two different sides. Thank you. <laughs> Just the last couple of weeks, been re reading a doctoral thesis on that, which needs 300 pages to develop on that, so it's a bit difficult. Um, I, I would think that, of course, in the EU we have one of the fundamental problems. What we are trying to do here is largely coming out of the logic of penal law, and, and anyone who works with the institution knows penal law and coming to agreements in Europe is very, very difficult. And what is understood as a crime in one country may be acceptable cultural practice in another one and completely legal in the third. That makes it very, very difficult. So the, the U.S. have an enormous advantage in that, in that respect, I think. Um, I think it's also e equally clear that uh, the U.S. have an enormous amount of political weight behind it. The fact that there's a, an annual report on trafficking in persons published by the State Department which for many countries is really the most important reference for them, are they doing okay or not, uh, in terms of what they're doing against trafficking is extremely important. Um, I would tend to think that some of the social, global social protection discussion in Europe might be more helpful than what we're seeing in the US. As you will have heard from my, my answer to the last question, I think 
combating tra if you don't want to talk about how migration is organized and if you don't want to talk about how labor relations are organized in Europe, you shouldn't be talking about trafficking. And I think in that one, at least in the area of, of, of labor relations, we might have a more protection-oriented discussion here in at least some EU countries. Um, in both countries, what we have as a big, big problem, the elephant in the room, is that trafficking is related to migration and that any, any move which is seen as being too friendly to migrants is not very popular at the moment. That goes both for the US and, and, and for the EU. In many, many cases, the assessment of assistance organizations is to say people who have been trafficked, people who have been victimized in a certain country should maybe, uh, because their infrastructure is usually better in that country, but also maybe in a way of compensation have some kind of residence rights, some kind of social support in that country. But as it is a migration question, it's very, very controversial and we're not getting very far with it. And I think that's true for both, both, both sides of the Atlantic. I would say that uh, it is critical uh, in America, they are learning and we are learning that it requires a multi-pronged approach. Uh, and two of the most important uh, prongs or parts of this, the first is awareness. People are just not aware uh, that this is going on. They're not aware that it's going on around them. And so giving people information as that will help them identify when human trafficking is happening right in their very midst is very important. Uh, for example, uh, if you have a young person who doesn't speak to you, uh, but is in your neighborhood, lives in your community, but is always uh, silent and never speaks, that's often an indicator that there is a problem. Or uh, someone who uh, uh, moves, neighbors who live next to you and never speak, uh, is, it, it's also a, a problem. Uh, so there is a sense of uh, being able to identify, the, the, the public needs to be able to be sensitive to uh, a young girl who is uh, not in school, but you see her every day, uh, and those kinds of problems. The other is, I think uh, America and I think the, the EU has a great opportunity, and I call it just celebrating human dignity. I think we, we have to, if we can sell Coca-Cola, and we, if we can co convince the uh, mind of men with uh, advertising and propaganda that something is good for you, even when it's not, <laughs> uh, we have the ability to utilize uh, all of the genius of our uh, marketing and advertising savvy to raise the awareness uh, that human dignity is something that we all celebrate. And, and this may sound simplistic to some, but I think it's a necessary approach. If you, if, you pull that pers if you pull that away from what we do to combat human trafficking, you really have no reason to combat it. You have no, no purpose for combating it. So putting forward the celebration that of, the hu of human dignity and that dignity, human dignity is not for sale and I come back because this is a phrase that uh, I put together in my phrase, and that is in, in my preparation for this talk, and that is uh, a nation without integrity is a danger to humanity. We have to integrate our philosophy and our principles with the conduct of the nation. Thank you. So, Janus. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, presenters, I, I am very happy that we, we talk about this issue. In, in my understanding, after you presented, it seems that there are two kinds of trafficking. One is the organized and w the other one would be the voluntary. And uh, I have two sets of questions. One, regarding the organized trafficking, have, have you or, or anybody detected any routes of trafficking from non-EU countries? And uh, how, how did you address that issue? And do the immigration offices know about this issue? Because when they come into a country, an EU country, I think that the immigration officer or offices should, should somehow detect this. And there are certain patterns of people. They, they should be aware of that this is not a very clean coming into the country. And the second set of questions would be on the voluntary trafficking, when, when somebody with a good hope, travels into a Western European country in order to maybe accumulate, accumulate some wealth or, or gather some, some money for studies or whatever reason. Do we have in the European Union a tracking system where we, we can track these people and maybe get information? Are they actually being treated fairly? Are they being treated according to the, the laws and regulations of the EU, and also the police. Is the police or are the police forces aware of this, this fact? I just heard this, this week a BBC report that a police force from Latvia called the police force in Ireland, and they raised this issue, and uh, the police force from Ireland responded that Oh, this is, this is not a problem. We don't see this as a problem. It is your problem. You deal with it. And it was closed down. So, you know, it, it seems that, that this issue is not yet raising the necessary awareness at the necessary levels. Allow me to uh, just address the first part of your question, and then maybe someone can address the second part. Um, this, this concept of immigration and border control is a very uh, spotty one when it comes to quality. Uh, we, we, our view of it is uh, very Western and very organized. But as you know, when you travel to so many parts of the world, uh, it is a, a corruption is an issue. And so it's very easy to bribe and to uh, allow criminal activity to pass through uh, very uh, porous borders. Uh, one interesting uh, response to that problem uh, was is being carried out by the wonderful lady who won the uh, CNN Hero Award uh, this past 2010. Uh, she runs a program called Mighty Nepal. And uh, she has rescued thousands of girls from uh, trafficking. She actually, there are 10, I think she said about 10 borders or border control points between India and Nepal. And uh, she appoints and has placed four uh, of the victims that she has rescued at those, for, for each at those 10 border points to identify the girls who are being trafficked and then point them out to the uh, immigration offices to, uh, to pull them off of their transit, their buses, and and look deeper into their situations because they're just not trained and uh, but it's it's a it's a very interesting uh, approach that she has taken and they do this 24 hours a day these these 40 girls are at these border points between India and Nepal and they are stationed there 
24-7 and just to identify uh, the girls that need a little extra checking by border police and immigration? <clears throat> the first point, I, I think we, we would leave you with the wrong message if we said that there's voluntary trafficking. Uh, the motives may be different from the, out, the outset situation may be different, but to be very honest, at least in a European context, the cases where you talk about abduction or somebody being drugged and dragged away are rare. They happen, but they're rare, so in most cases there is a hope at the beginning, an agreement, yes, I want to do that which makes it very, very difficult at immigration, because at immigration is usually a point when it hasn't gone wrong yet. And, and I, would, I, I know about these, these programs of border checks. I, I, they're a very mixed bag, to be very, very honest. Uh, trafficking, the border is usually not the point where trafficking has already occurred. The exploit, it becomes trafficking when an exploitation sets in, and normally that is after the border crossing. So the only chance we really have to look is to say, we have a fairly good idea where exploitation is happening or may be happening. Um, to say, yeah, we can't see it. If we don't want to see it, we can't see it. If we want to see it, I think we have a fairly good idea where to look. Um, but it, is, it takes time, it takes money, it takes energy, and it takes an, an interest to say, not only we're looking at a building site and want to arrest the people who are working there without documents, but to say, we want to ask them, have you been exploited? And maybe go after those who exploited them. Um, how it is the routes. Yes, we have some idea how the routes are organized, but they're changing very, very rapidly. And to be very honest, I've been, been, I know the situation for the last 10 years a bit better. I, there's lots of things I can't explain. If you talk about colleague here, Bulgaria, you had used to have lots of Bulgarians here in, 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 in Belgium, for example. Exploitation and uh, sexual exploitation, Bulgarians were one of the biggest groups until two, three years ago. It's very much in decline. Now the same kind of group turns up in Germany, in the UK. We can't really explain why, to be very, very honest. Um, the tracking system, no, there's no such tracking system. And I think we also have to be aware Trafficking is an important problem, but if we look at the general migratory route, it still is a small one. Out of 100 people pro who cross the border to go for a student exchange for a football tournament or whatever, maybe two run into problems. It's important that we inform the 100, and that's what can be done at the immigration points to say, here, have a leaflet with a hotline number. You, probably things will go perfectly fine for you. If they go, don't go fine for you, that's not the end of the story. There's help available. I think that would be the most important thing. Um, and police forces, there's been a lot of specialization of police in the last two decades, I should say. In some countries, this has also grown roots in the broader police force, in others it hasn't. So uh, in almost any country, you would have a group of specialized police who know trafficking inside out, but how much that would get across to the ordinary police, who might often be the first ones to be in contact, who could be ad those identifying or not, differs from country to country. And once again, it's also, if you send the police out of say, and saying, make sure that the pavements are clear and the, the public order is not disturbed, it's a different thing than to say, if you meet somebody who looks a bit funny, investigate, ask if he or she has problems. So it often has to do with the intention which is behind it. Thank you. So <clears throat> there's some special records to Mr. Pips, but before that, what I, I don't tell yet, so you can guess what it's going to be. But anyway, there's one question, and then in the lady there in the... So, uh, Hi, my question follows on from um, the close connection between human trafficking and immigration laws. Um, and I was wondering whether there has been a change with some of the um, east-west trafficking, uh, whether there's been a change with the incorporation of those um, uh, Eastern European countries into the European Union, whether that's changed the approach. Um, and so the second part then, uh, if that is the case, um, is there then a difference between the approach for east-west trafficking and global south, global north trafficking in terms of how victims are treated? Mm, to, to be very honest, um, to come to the second one first, um, what we saw in a lot of countries is that if you had, and it's been happening after the enlargement 2004, but also after the one in 2007, that we had support programs, investigation operations, which were exclusively looking at non-EU citizens. 
So when the first round of anti-trafficking legislation was conceived, 2002, 2003, 2004, on EU level, it talked about third country nationals. Uh, the new directive changes that, but so far most of the instruments we had were looking at non-EU citizens. So the moment that a Romanian was victim of trafficking, say in Germany, there was little legislation available, little support. That has been changed a bit over time, but the initial fact was, yes, there was, was hardly anything foreseen. If the picture has changed or not is something we don't know that much. As I said, there are certain routes which are changing. We can, in, in the national statistics, say group from country A and country B it, it has changed. Um, what we find in the area of trafficking for forced labor is that more and more big groups of EU citizens are being exploited in other EU countries. And some of the most, some cases have been very prominent. The big group of Polish work has been exploited in southern Italy. And, uh, groups of Romanians being exploited in the Czech Republic. Um, that is something we have seen, but whether that is a direct consequence of, of the enlargements or not is not clear. What we also know is that, particularly in the area of trafficking for sexual exploitation, a lot of the police are no longer really investigating very thoroughly if they see EU citizens, because it's no longer something where you could have an initial starting point with residence uh, permit violation, and very often the police then says, it would be too complicated to investigate it. So, thank you. So, Mr. Phipps, there is someone who heard that you sang in this morning and <laughs> they didn't be able to do part of that, uh, take part of that uh, event. So, uh, when we going, we're going to move of the, on the build of the dignity of human life, but before that, you know, you mentioned something about slavery and, uh, and, uh, and uh, might be, if you can, even though that we don't have the loud speakers here, um, sing or perform some some song or might be some uh, some uh, uh, negro spiritual for example it can be uh, so and and then after that we can uh, go into the next next part then Mr. Kalervo Aromagi going to say some words con concerning on beauty and the dignity of my life but so floor is now yours <laughs> well uh, for the people I have sung in many different places before, uh, in, uh, at the White House, uh, in Congress, at least I'll be able to say I sang at the European Union. Uh, but really, uh, the, the thing that I want to leave with you is a song really just represents for those who have been victims of human trafficking in America and slavery in America song uh, and the gift of song has uh, represented the resiliency of the human spirit. And it really says that even though uh, some of the most deplorable uh, circumstances uh, in life can happen to you, uh, there are ways that the human spirit has to survive and to uh, rebuild, it, it is just amazing. And so uh, there's a, just a little uh, a song that, uh, and for th those of you who may not know, if you go to YouTube, you'll see this, but uh, just about all Negro spirituals, uh, the songs that the slaves sung to keep them uh, motivated and inspired and, and, and keep hope alive, as we would say, in the midst of oppression and in the midst of slavery. Uh, all of those songs they wrote, you can go home and play them if you just play the black notes on the piano. The, 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 the black notes on the piano represent what in music we know as the pentatonic scale. And the slaves did not have the do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do scale. Uh, they only had the pentatonic scale as their musical scale. And they built all these songs that helped them be resilient on this scale. And so probably the most famous of them, the melody is from uh, the melody of a, a West African sorrow chant. And the words were written by, interestingly enough, a man who used to traffic in slaves. Uh, his name was John Newton. He was the captain of a slave ship uh, but when he gave his life to God and changed his life, he uh, uh, wrote
wrote the words of this song, and many believe set those words to this melody that sounds very much like a West African sorrow chant that slaves used to sing uh, to keep hope alive. And so I'll just hum it and just sing one verse of it, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. human trafficking all over the world find their point of grace, their point of return, their point of healing, their point of wholeness, even if it is only through the words and melody of a song. Thank you, Wendley. And then it's my pleasure to introduce our final speaker, Mr. Kalervi, Kalervo Aromaki, who will give a more philosophical account on the topic. Mr. Aromaki has degrees in theology as well as theology. Kalervo is, I know him a long time, multi-talented people, and he works as a pastor and also as a researcher in an area of prevent prevention of youth at risk behavior. His experience, experience includes working at alcohol and drug treatment unit in U.S. Army Hospital, California. For many years, he has also been teaching, counseling, and related topics at the Asia Pacific International Univers University in Thailand. So, Kalervo, now floor is yours. Thank you, Hannu. And I wish to applaud uh, and uh, your colleagues for putting up this seminar and the staff that have been working behind this. And I wish to applaud also those of you who are participating in this very human, uh, human uh, tra tragedy, if to say so. And I also find it very hard to speak now because the, the previous song really captured the human condition. But uh, since I've been asked to say a few words, I, I, I wish uh, I want to say it. Could you think that your life is beautiful? I asked uh, Tina after uh, she had related me to her life story. She grew up with a uh, single parent and alcoholic father. Her first sexual experience was by abuse. 
there were others who came after. However, her life seemed to straighten out at some point. She completed her high school, became a nurse, entered a professional life, got married, got children. Her life seemed to be in order and on the right track. Then somehow her past seemed to get hold of her and uh, she sought to soothe her pain by alcohol. And life became a struggle by life falling apart, putting pieces back together again, falling apart again. As she said, I've been drinking for the past month, day and night. Before that, I was sober for five to six years. I'm so ashamed of myself. Shame arises when we are observed and judged. In other words, valued and found not to be enough, found wanting. Not to speak of those forced into circumstances where the daily experience deepens the sense of this value, shame and powerlessness. Shame brought on by the actions or non-actions of others, as well, of course, actions or non-actions by myself. And all this prevents us from seeing our true condition, the beauty and dignity, on the other hand, and the fragility and finitude of each individual human life. Many have accepted their present condition and learned to live a shame-filled life. And I believe shame is natural human condition. Many have given up the beauty and dignity of human life and submitted to a life or forced to a life of quiet desperation. I believe also even here within this magnificent building we are. Then there are those who act on their own shame on others. Not necessarily by trafficking, but by exploiting already vulnerable. When we deny our true human condition, the dignity and beauty, and on the other hand, the vulnerability, oh, sorry, the vulnerability, mm, sorry, okay, okay, I had difficulties with that word. <laughs> Let's say it this way, fragility and finitude of human life, evil arises. When I deny my true condition, the end result is evil which I project on others. Trafficking is evil because the sole purpose is to profit and benefit of the, from other human beings. And I believe shame and evil is at the core of human trafficking. Tina's answer to me was, I cannot believe it is true that my life can be beautiful. It is too thick to be true, and yet it is true. No matter what has happened to us, no matter what others have done or we have done, human life is beautiful, even though we may not see it. As an ancient songwriter, never doubting the excellency of creator's design said, when I look at the moon and the stars, what is a man that you should mind of him? Yet you created him a little lower than the angels and trusted into his care, human life and life in general. There are three groups of people uh, 
in response to this particular issue generally in life. There are those of victims. If I do not understand the, the dignity and beauty of human life, I have no reasons to protect myself. Of course, there are those who never had any chance because their dignity was taken away from them. But in order for me to understand, it gives me boundaries. It gives me protection against exploitation. Then there are those of perpetrators who take advantage of those already vulnerable. If I do not understand the dignity of human life, I have no reason to protect the dignity and another human being. Then there are those innocent bystanders. And I'm so glad that you are here today. You can't be innocent anymore. Innocent bystanders who have to choose how to respond. How to respond to this evil that is happening around us. Greeks taught us and still teach us, and I believe this is also a biblical principle, that the good life consists of two things, two things only. That I take responsibility for my life that I accept the life as it is given to me under the circumstances it's given to me. Well, some puzzles may be broken, but it is still the puzzle that is being given to me, that I accept it. And the other one, that I live it in such a way that my life makes a difference. Those two things go hand in hand. I can be responsible without feeling that my life is significant. And I can seek significance through experiences without being responsible. But being responsible and living a life of significance, making a difference in this life, is what good life, happy life, is all about. And I want to close my brief thoughts on two little stories. This is not directly related to the uh, issue of trafficking, but I believe it has a certain message within it. And this is written by Köstler, and its name is Departures and Arrivals. It tells about 22-year-old Peter who lived in a, in, a, in a country ruled by a uh, cruel regime. And Peter tried, had tried to oppose, as some of his co-patriots had been doing by distributing all sorts of literature. And then one day he was caught and he was interrogated. And those who were questioning him wanted to know who were his co-patriots, who were those who were part of his crew. And, uh, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't reveal, he wouldn't crack down. Well, actually, they didn't need to know his information because they knew who his co-patriots were. But they wanted to crack his will, crack his identity, but he wouldn't give up. So they kind of helped him to escape the country to a neutral landia. And now that Peter was, now he had the freedom to choose what to do with his life, but he couldn't choose. And his indecision brought him so that he was paralyzed. And his condition worsened because he found a lady that uh, he began to like. And this lady was saying, hey, come with me to America. There you can fulfill your life. 
Okay, you can go to a college, then you can make a good living, good, nice life. But Peter couldn't decide. And a uh, psychotherapist promised to help him, and as they were talking about Peter's experience, I went through, and they came to his uh, fourth year. And Peter said, yes, I was guilty in the accident that killed my younger brother. He had been carrying guilt about his life all those years, about what happened to his younger brother. But this psychotherapist was, uh, was uh, able to uh, convince him that he need, need not carry guilt, that he's free from that guilt. And finally, Peter was free to choose what to do with his life. And so he was planning to go to America. And as he was uh, entering the plane, he turned around and went to the plane that took him to England. And that book ends when Peter is on the, uh, on the plane, on the way back to his home country, to jump to his country and to tell how cruel is the regime that is ruling the country. Life of responsibility with a life of significance. And I end with Tina. I had not met her for 10 years until this March. I saw her coming to a place where I was, and she came directly to me and said, do you remember me? I'm the one you spoke, you met when I was in a terrible condition. And I want to tell you something. I've given up drinking. My life is back on track again. I've started to attend a church and so forth. But then she said, but I have this little, little thing I often think I do not seem to understand when you said, could you think that your life is beautiful? Yes, life is beautiful. Let us never lose sight of it in our personal life or in the life of someone else. And let us do something to uphold that dignity of every human beings. Thank you. Thank Kalervo. Uh, I would like to thank our speakers who gave us a profound picture of human trafficking and its current situation in Europe and behind, beyond. It seems to me that there is much to do and future actions are needed. And I really hope that this is some kind of starting point, you know, that now we, we can look for the next step what we're going to, what we're going to take. And maybe that's the way how we can encourage our colleagues to do something and act something in that field. Because it seems to me that it's a little bit embarrassing and many, many um, parliament members and many people in, in Europe, Europe, they avoid to talk about this issue because it is something embarrassing for, for us. So thank you for your attention, and I, I would like to thank our, our panelists. Time is running, and then the final conclude, I'm going to give the, our vice president of the Human, uh, Human Rights Committee, Mr. Kasak. Thank you very much, Hanu. Thank you very much also uh, for having the possibility to, to discuss such an important and sensitive issue for uh, all the countries in the world. I think not only for the EU, but also we had a very, very emotional uh, presentation by Mr. Phipps. Uh, I think uh, as a member of the Subcommittee on Human Rights in the European Parliament that we as uh, European Parliament, we have to be uh, the leader, uh, we have to lead the, all the efforts at the EU level in order to overcome uh, this, uh, this uh, serious, serious problem. And uh, I, I can assure you also, together with our colleagues from the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats, uh, because the human rights is in the core of our, uh, of our uh, values, I think we have to work 
closely and more uh, in close cooperation with the civil society, with the media, with all the society in order to not allow anymore uh, that the human dignity is put into the danger and to work together to have better life, more, digni more human dignity and more freedom in our society. Thank you very much to our distinguished panelists. Thank you very much for all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for participating in our seminar. Thank you.